meeting of uh, Wednesday, October 12th to, uh, to order. Superintendent, please call the roll. Mr. Bagoli? Present. Mrs. Cahill? Present. Mr. Gattro? Present. Mrs. Hubley? Present. Mrs. Lebo? Present. Mr. Santoro? Present. And Mayor Cope? Present. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. The superintendent has a memoriam tonight. If you could please keep in your thoughts and prayers the following QPS educators who have passed away most recently. The first is Marjorie Boker, an elementary school guidance counselor for 18 years. Next is Patricia Nee, an elementary school special education teacher for over 30 years. And Anita Simon, elementary school teacher for 35 years. Again, if you could keep these individuals and their families in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you. Okay, before we begin, I want to read the statement. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and uh, permissible. Also, at this time, I'd like to take a motion to approve the regular meeting uh, minutes of September 28th. Motion to approve. Motion by Mrs. Hubley, seconded by Mrs. Lebo. We approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item B, executive session minutes for September 28th. Motion. Motion of Mr. Bergoli, seconded by Mr. Gattro. We approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. <clears throat> Item 2, open forum. This is an opportunity for community input regarding the QPS community. In this context, uh, context it is defined as a resident of the city of Quincy, a parent of a student who attends QPS, or an employee of QPS. Non-community persons uh, are not permitted to speak at the open forum, but they may submit written statements to the school committee. After giving, giving his or her name and address, each speaker may make a presentation of no more than four minutes to the school committee, and an individual may not exchange their time or yield to others. Interested parties may also submit written statements. Is there anybody tonight for open forum? Anybody for open forum? Seeing none, I'll close that session of the meeting. Superintendent's report. Item A, Superintendent. Thank QPS you. October 1st enrollment and class size data. Thank you and good evening everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, the uh, presentation tonight will be as the um, chairman said, QPS October 1st enrollment and class size data. Obviously that was shared with the school committee at your places and there's some highlights to include uh, for you tonight. The official October 1st enrollment number for QPS is 9,834 students, an increase of 222 students from October 1st of 2021. As you may remember, enrollment increased over the course of the last school year. By June of 2022, QPS enrollment was at a level not seen since the 1970s at 9,936 students. Since October 1st, 32 students have completed registration and another 50 students have registrations pending. So QPS enrollment will likely reach 9,900 by the end of October. Uh, the last page of the document uh, that you have in front of you has a breakdown of new registrations and transferring students by level to provide context for the administrative workload related to the over 1,500 student transactions that we did uh, over the summer and to date. Um, significant enrollment increases are at North Quincy High School with a um, plus of 63 students and Quincy High School with a plus of 26 students. The high school enrollments are almost identical at each high school at 1470 for North Quincy High School and 1475 for Quincy High School. Atlantic Middle School has 27 additional students and Southwest Middle School has 45 additional students and they've seen the largest increases at the middle school level. At the elementary level, Clifford Marshall has an increase of 44 students and has returned close to the pre-pandemic pre level of enrollment. 
The class size average for kindergarten through grade five is very favorable at 19 students. For grades six through eight, core curriculum, cl core curriculum classes, 88.1% of classes have 24 or fewer students. The low end of school committee's class size range and no classes are above 28 students. For grades nine through 12, core, cur core curriculum classes, 80.1% of classes have 25 or fewer students. 2.4% are above class size range of 28, a total of 15 sections between the two high schools, and most of those sections are honors and AP sections. Detailed class size information at the school level will be shared during the school improvement plan presentations by each school in November, of course, and we can further discuss that um, at subcommittee as well. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions before we move on. Mayor Cook. Uh, thank you, Superintendent. Um, just a question, because I've been asked uh, a number of times on the street, um, undocumented uh, students, are we seeing an increase or surge with what's going on nationally? Is it having an effect on our district? I don't believe we have seen anything. I don't anything. believe so, no. No, no, okay. we, do, no. we do have six families recently arrived from the Ukraine. Okay. Um, that's the sort of the, the biggest clump of uh, folks we're seeing from one place right now. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Mr. Bergoli. Uh, are there any... Um, Classes that are above our max, and where would that be? So, yeah, yeah. do you want to talk about that? Yep. So there's the 15. There's 15 classes at the high school that have 29 or 30 students, and those are uh, there's detail on the page on the class size page for high school, mostly AP and honors sections, and we can we'll continue to look at those numbers because as the we go into the second term, sometimes students shift classes, so there may be some shifting there as you remember from last year we had concern of class size at north quincy high school we did reduce that by 30 percent between last year and this year but obviously we're continuing to look at those numbers to see if we can reduce them even further and how about the uh elementary pre-k elementary and pre-k we find the, that yeah the average class size for elementary school is 19 students 19. Um, no class across the city hmm? <clears throat> none higher than that Oh yes, I mean yes, I mean that's the that's yeah, the average. median, that's the average class size. So we do have some, we have none above twenty four. We have some fifth grade classes that are twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, and that that details also in the packet. Okay, Mrs. Lebo. Yeah, um, Ms. Mulvey, I was wondering if we could get the information on how many out of district students we have. Sure. It's usually, I think it's usually included here. Okay. It, it, it is. It's, it's on the yeah. it's on the page with the uh, totals. Oh, it is? Yes. Where the district is. I think it's the bottom line above the totals. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I'd like to know where they are, if possible. Okay, sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, Superintendent. Uh, item B. Thank you. QPS staff recognition. I want to congratulate Quincy Public School Athletic Director Kevin Mahoney, who was recently named as the MIA. District 9 nominee for the statewide Ted Damco Award. This award recognizes an athletic administrator with five or fewer years of experience who exemplifies the highest standards of the profession and has made significant contributions to their school. So congratulations to Mr. Mahoney. Unfortunately, Mr. Mahoney uh, can join us tonight. We have a big volleyball game between North Quincy and Quincy High tonight, and he is attending that event. But I do want to make sure that I congratulate Mr. Mahoney for this, for this honor. He certainly deserves it. <laughs> okay. Item C, upcoming events. Thank you. Upcoming Quincy Public School and City of Quincy events that the community should be aware of. The Massachusetts Instrumental and Choral Conductors Association <clears throat> are hosting the statewide marching band competition at Veterans Memorial Stadium on Sunday, October 23rd at 11 a.m. 21 high school and regional marching bands are scheduled to perform, including the Quincy North Quincy High School Marching Band in Color Guard, so best of luck to them. And um, based on last year's event, it will be a very exciting event, and I think the community will really, really enjoy it. And it brings out many, many people, so it's, it's a really fun event. Just the, before you go on to the next item, Superintendent, I just want to take a minute to congratulate uh, anyone that uh, has to deal uh, do with the band, because um, I've seen them perform a couple of times, and they're just, it's just outstanding to see how Quincy Public Schools has come so far with their band, because I do remember the days when the band was quite lean. Yes. And uh, 
they look very sharp and uh, po poised and uh, exceptional job to all those who uh, run our band. And thank you to this committee and the mayor, of course, for funding all of the upgrades that have been done over the years for the band, and of course our band directors who are doing an excellent job with regard to all of the students who participate. I can just add to that. Um, <clears throat> You know, we focus a lot on our high school athletics, which we should, but you're more likely to get uh, a college scholarship if you're a member of the band uh, than you are as a, an athlete in the city. So uh, I think our, our band directors have done a fabulous job. They've, they've really upgraded the program, and I think uh, with the mayor's help and superintendent, uh, uh, we really have done a great job with the kids, and uh, it's going to open some doors for them. Mrs. Lebo. I, I also just want to thank the band boosters who have been incredible supporting the program throughout the years and really pushing us to do the best we can for that group. One more. Mayor. One more item on that. I happened to get a uh, text from the general manager <clears throat> of the MBTA, Steve Popchak, the other day, who sent me a picture of the Quincy North Quincy High School band marching in the Roslindale Roslindale <laughs> Day Parade. Mm -hmm. And he said they were the most impressive band on the parade. Oh, so nice. congratulations to our band. Nice. That's great. Thank you all. Okay, Superintendent. English Learner Parent Advisory Council meeting. Yes, the first English Learner Parent Advisory Council LPAC meeting of the year will be held on November 3rd at 6 p.m. via Zoom. And we'll make sure that uh, obviously that's sent out to the entire community along with the Zoom link so that as many uh, parents uh, can participate as possible. And the lastly, the dedication of the new Abigail Adams statue in Hancock on the Hancock Adams Common will be held on Saturday, November 5th at 11 a.m. Okay, moving on to uh, item D, grades four and five instrumental music update. Thank you. Our instrumental music teachers have recently completed instrument <coughs> demonstrations for all grades, four and five students, and held an instrument rental evening for parents with our partner, KNC Music. Um, there has been an outstanding response with over 250 students across all school sites enrolled in the instrumental music program. So. We have not only interest at the high school level, but we have a very high interest in our instrumental music program in grades four and five as well. So um, that's excellent news. And thank you to our partner, KNC Music, for continuing to be a great partner with us and providing our students with the musical instruments that they need. Item E, Gleam Grant Update. As you remember, I had <clears throat> mentioned the Gleam Update a Gleam Grant uh, update last time as well. I have um, even better news than what I updated you with the last time. I'm pleased to announce that the Quincy Public Schools has been awarded, awarded an additional $147,278 for year two of the Growing Literacy Equity Across Massachusetts Gleam Grant. So together, based on the numbers they gave you last time, with, um, with the original 594942 award reported, at the last school committee meeting, the total grant for this school year will be $742,220. Thank you to Bridget Vaughn for helping us to capture that <coughs> uh, grant, as well as other members of the SLT, including Senior, Senior Director of Cur Curriculum, Madeline Roy. Uh, so with that, that ends my superintendent's report. Thank, Thank you, you, superintendent. Item four, old business. The uh, revision of school committee policy uh, book Section 9.11.5, graduation requirements. This is up for a vote. Mr. Bergoli. Uh, we reviewed that um, school committee policy and uh, subcommittee approved it, the, uh, the changes. Uh, the highlight of that is the um, reinstatement of the uh, community service piece. Um, and that's up for our vote tonight. So does anybody have any questions on that item? Questions? Before we uh, vote. Seeing none, take a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Gattro, seconded by Mrs. Cahill. We approve. Superintendent, call the roll. Mr. Bergoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Coke? Yes. Thank you. New business. Superintendent 2021-2022 uh, goals reflection and spring 2022 assessment data. Superintendent.
Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you all for joining us for our Quincy Public School Superintendent's 2021-2022 Goals Reflection in Spring 2022 Assessment Data. With us here tonight is Assistant Superintendent Aaron Perkins, who will assist in presenting, as well as Senior, Dir Senior Director of Curriculum, Madeline Roy. We have our, um, uh, our um, Curriculum Administrators, um, Kim Quinn and Bridget Vaughn, as well as our data coordinator, um, uh, Christiani. So thank you all for helping with the presentation tonight. Uh, tonight's presentation is very uh, in-depth, and you'll hear a lot of data. Um, we have been working pretty continuously over the last several weeks um, preparing for this. And of course, when the MCAS data landed um, a couple weeks ago, um, we were we began working immediately with regard to putting all of the data together for your review. Uh, initially, the presentation we had before you tonight was <laughs> approximately 120 slides, but we managed to pare that down in, in a concise way, uh, a very um, comprehensive way. So the information you'll see tonight will hopefully be user-friendly and kind of at a glance data that will help you understand how we're doing here in the Quincy Public Schools and um, where we see uh, the future of our goals going, and of course, the quality of our education within the Quincy Public Schools. And of course, I just wanna make sure that I thank all of our staff throughout the Quincy Public Schools who made all of this uh, data possible, as well as um, making sure that two very difficult years that our students and families faced were minimized as much as possible. I think you'll see that in the data, although it was two very difficult years and there was commentary out there that they were two lost years. I think you'll see in this data that because of the very hard work of all of our QPS teachers and staff and guidance counselors, uh, the SLT and Assistant Superintendent Perkins, you'll see that together as a team, we helped mitigate those very, very difficult years and made efforts uh, for our students to progress educationally. So with that, um, I'll hand the presentation over to Mrs. Perkins to begin the review. Sorry about that. So thank you very much for having us here tonight. Um, as the superintendent said, you, you know, you were just introduced to the team. Uh, Maddie and I are very, very fortunate to have the ability to work with this curriculum team. You heard Superintendent Mulvey mention, you know, just a highlight of Bridget's work, but the, the people sitting around this table tonight are really phenomenal. And uh, we spent, as su the superintendent said, we spent a lot of time analyzing and going through this data. There is a lot of information and a lot to discuss. And there are some things that we certainly can follow up, you know, at a later point uh, to continue to discuss if you'd like more information or you'd need something clarified. Um, but the first thing we wanted to start with, because we thought it was important, was the state data. So I just want to take a minute to share with you some of the trends that have been seen throughout the state of Massachusetts, because I think what you're going to see today is that what happened in Quincy very strongly mimics what the state experienced. Um, you know, so I just want to remind everyone that 2022 school year was the first full administration of MCAS for grades three to eight since 2019. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. In 2019, there was a full administration of the test. In 2020, there were no tests administered, as, as you all know. In 2021, half of the tests were administered. And in 2022, the full test was administered. So, uh, administered. so I think that you know we had fourth grade students who had never taken the MCAS before. They were taking it for the first time. Um, so, you know, so I just think that's like important to keep in mind as we review the data and we look at the data to figure out, you know, where we are. And I will say that when you see the data, 
as the state, I think the state phrased it um, really appropriately that we see signs of recovery in the data, but we also see areas that we really need to focus on. Um, so the, the, the 2020 MCAS results showed a mixed result compared with the 2021 scores, and this is across the state. So what we saw, and we also saw this in Quincy, and you'll hear about this, um, that our math scores increased, as did the states. Our English ELA scores declined, and that was the, that is very uh, the state did you know happened it happened the same way, and the science scores um, increased slightly. And so what I do want to point out about the ELA scores before Bridget goes into them and talks about them is that, as I said, we have children, or we had children in the district, we still do, who had significant interrupted learning, in particular at the elementary level. The elementary level are crucial years for literacy skills. So just like the rest of the state saw, we also saw in Quincy that the early literacy scores you took a hit during COVID, they, they were a concern. They continue to be a concern, and you'll hear Bridget talk about some of the things that we're doing to remediate that, but we really need to focus on the foundational skills in the upper elementary levels and the middle school levels because the children that were in the lower elementary levels at that time missed you know, quite a bit, um, you know, by no one's fault, just by the state of the way the world was at, at that moment. So. Um, when compared to some of the results to the pre-pandemic levels, just like the state, we have a ways to go in a lot of areas. It's not the same as it was. This is a baseline year. So this is the, the state has very clearly told us that we are not to compare, you know, the results, um, you know, from past years because this is a new baseline. So this is where we are. We need to get back to where we were, and that very well could take a few years for us to get there. The other thing that was really interesting was that um, the 2022 writing results declined significantly across the state, and we also saw this in Quincy. So um, the number of test takers across the state receiving a score of zero points increased from 19% in 2019 to 31% in 2022. And we saw some of this in Quincy as well. And so what you know, what you see is that you have children who were presented with the essay. Every test has an essay uh, in ELA. They were presented with an essay, and they just literally put nothing on the paper. Mm. Um, and so that you know, that's something that we saw. That's something that the state saw. Um, so the average point scored per essay decreased in grades three to eight, with the largest decreases in grades three to five. And just to kind of give you a picture. So the average points um, earned on an essay in uh, 2019 for stu a student in grades three to five, a student on average in the state of Massachusetts would earn about 2.8 points. The essays, the possible points, were seven points. So that's 2019, seven points possible. On average, our kids in the state of Massachusetts earned 2.8 points. In 2022, that dropped to 2.1%. So the state saw an almost 25% change from 2019 to 2022. In grades 6 to 8, the average points earned were 3.8% for our students, and the essay was worth 8 points. In 2022, it dropped to 3.3%, and so the state saw an average decrease of 13% from 2019. So that's just to give you a picture, because we, we're seeing the same thing um, here in Quincy. The other thing I just want to point out before I turn it over to my colleagues is that obviously we all know that at student absenteeism remains a challenge for recovery. Um, so students, and this is, this is again statewide data, Students have attended less school, as we know, over the past several years. The average student missed 11 days in 2021 and 15 days in 2022. 18% of all students missed 18 or more school days in 2028 and 28% of 18 days or more in 2022. And you will see this in our chronic absenteeism data. Chronic absenteeism for students in grade three to eight increased in 2022 by 138% statewide. So this is a difference of 41,000 students considered chronically absent in 2019 to 98,000 students considered chronically absent in 2019, uh, um, it, it, from uh, there in 2022. So, um, and as I said, so this is a new baseline 
moving forward. But we just wanted to share that with you because it's really important when you look at the data to have an idea of what is happening across the state with MCAS scores, where Quincy falls in relation to the rest of the state. Um, and I think in general, our students, our teachers, our staff, as Superintendent Mulvey said, did a really wonderful job. Um, and we do definitely see signs of recovery, and we do absolutely see, see, see areas where we need to work on. And um, the team here will talk more about that with you. In terms of accountability data, Chris will talk about the accountability data. The accountability data is back, but it is a light version of the accountability data. There are no new targets, and Chris will explain that to you. So again, it is just a baseline year. Our parent guardian reports are almost available. They should be going, uh, being mailed out sometime at the end of next week. We have them here. We're just uh, collating them. We send them to the schools, and then the schools in turn mail them out to the families. So they should be getting that sometime in the next week or so. And then we do have Nove the November retest for high school students that need to, to do that. And the schools are informing those students if they need to do that. So even though the results have not been mailed out, they are letting those students know uh, if they need to take the retest. So before I turn it over, I just wanted to, we always share this with you. It's just a data point. It's our participation rate for MCAS. And as always, Quincy Public Schools scores either equal to or better than the state in terms of participation. We had really great participation last year in our MCAS um, in all grades. Uh, it's something that we're proud of. I think that we do a really nice job making sure that our kids are present, are cared for, and are um, taking the test when they need to. And um, so it's just, it's just a data point to share. And with that, I will turn it over to Kim. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I have the pleasure tonight to present and reflect on how we did last year with our district math goals, as well as look ahead to this coming year. Last year, our district goal and the superintendent's student learning goal was to increase three achievement percentage points in grades three to eight, as evident by the spring 2022 MCAS results by achievement level school district and state comparison report. The graph before you shows the math MCAS achievement percentages comparing 2021 to 2022 district data and the 2022 state data. The blue bars are the students who achieved meeting or exceeding expectations, while the red illustrates those that fell to partially or not meeting expectations. We're very pleased with our increase in both grades three and four. In grade three, we increased our percentage of students in meeting or exceeding expectations by 8.9% from 2021, and we're above the state by 3.8%. Grade four showed even better results with an increase of 14.2% for students meeting or exceeding expectations, and that's 5.9% above the state. This is a strong sign of recovery, and I feel that this is just one more example that shows how important it is to have our students in school in front of us with their hands-on <coughs> math tools, being able to make connections and build understanding. We saw a slight increase in fifth grade with a half a percent increase from last year. Although we would have liked <coughs> this to have been a bigger <clears throat> increase, fifth grade still is 2.6% above the state. And in grade six, we saw an 11% increase while also being 2.6% above the state. And this is even more impressive because in the past, we often see a dip from fifth to sixth grade in those students that meet and exceed expectations. The grade seven results are an area of concern given that our meeting and exceeding expectations actually decreased and placed us below the state by 1.7%. Later in this presentation, I'll discuss this year's action steps that we have put into place to target this concern. On a more positive note, grade eight meeting and exceeding expectation increased by 4.5%, which was 3.2 over the state. And we also saw a slight improvement in grade 10, where there was an increase of 8 tenths of a percent in meeting and exceeding expectations, bringing us 5.6% above the state. 
So overall, we're very pleased with last year's math MCAS scores, given that we were still dealing with COVID, which brought about that high absenteeism. The results show that we're really moving in the right direction. Now, before I dive into our map, math data, I just want to remind you that the grade level, as, a, as our grade level increases, the RIT growth decreases. So for example, if we look at growth norms for grade three, the expectation from fall to spring is a gain of 12.6 RIP um, points, while in grade eight, the expectation is an increase of 5.38 RIP points. Last year, our district math map goals were to increase 10 RIP points from fall to spring for grade two, eight for grades three and four, and five for grades five and eight, five to eight. This graph shows the average math RIC growth in grades three to eight. Each bar graph comparison represents grade level growth in math from fall to spring, with the green bar showing fall and the purple bar showing spring. I'm thrilled to report that for the 2021-22 school year, we not only saw growth in every grade level, but we exceeded our goals in all grades. Our goal um, was an increase of eight RIP points for the fall, um, above the fall for grades three and four. And in grade three, we had an increase of 14.4 points. And in grade four, we increased 12.7 average RIP points. Our goal for, um, was five points above the fall average for grades five to eight. And in grade five, we had an average gain of 11.6 points. Grade six was 7.9 RIP points. Grade seven, 6.3, and grade eight was 6.9 RIP points. So it's great to be able to look and see this growth at all the grade levels, especially in grade five, where the MCAS growth was lower than we would have liked it, but the average growth, um, MAP growth was over 11 and a half RIP points. The same goes for grade seven, where their MCAS results flipped, but this increase by an average of 6.3 RIP points shows the gains are happening. So gains are being made, and we can clearly see how beneficial being back in the classroom has been for these students. Um, I just want to add one thing here. I do want to address the fact that grade two is not on here, which is what Kim was reminding me at the beginning that I forgot to share, was that um, grade two last year, um, thank you, Mrs. Lebo, had uh, brought a, a concern to our attention that we had been administering the K to two version and that we should be moving to the two to five version. And so we did do that in the middle of the year last year. So it's two different tests. So next year, you'll see grade two back in. But for this year, we didn't, because it's two different tests, we did not think that that was, um, it wasn't an accurate reflection of how the kids were doing. So that's why it, in both ELA and math, um, it's not in here this year, but it will be back. And if you have any questions about that, certainly we can provide you with that data. And this graph compares our math map achievement as a district to the national norms. Quincy is in orange while the national norms are in blue. And we can see that once again, our achievement is greater than the national norms. As we look forward, our district goal for this year for MAP will be that students in grades three to eight will show evidence of achievement in MAP as measured by the total increase of three achievement points in exceeding or meeting achievement levels from the spring 2022 as evident in the spring 2023 MAP district achievement distribution by year report. Now this may seem like a small amount, but that would roughly be about 120 students across grades three to eight that would need to move out of the partially or not meeting categories and move into the meeting and exceeding category. And our district um, goal for MAP would be for the students in grades two to eight to show evidence of growth in math as measured by the, the following increase in RIP points indicated in the spring 2022-23 MAP district summary report. So we'd be looking for a um, 10 RIP points above the fall average for grade two, eight RIP points above the fall average for grades three to four, and five RIP points above the fall average for grades five through eight. Last year, the elementary math action steps focused on training our K-2 teachers in illustrative mathematics while we researched new three to five core resources with our upper elementary teachers. This year, we continue to have a large focus on K-5. to We were in our first full year of implementation of illustrative mathematics for, for grades um, K-2 to 
and grade three to five is just, um, has just begun their IM training on September 28th. Guided math centers and number talks continue to be utilized to build um, fluency and number sense. And we are thrilled to have three new math interventionists joining our team this year, allowing for us to have math interventionists in all 11 elementary schools. We can't thank the school committee enough for being instrumental in making this happen. We're so fortunate to have you support, um, have your support in expanding this valuable team. They are already supporting our classroom teachers in the implementing of illustrative mathematics, and they're working with identified students in small groups on targeted instruction. Last year with the middle schools, we focused on extended day programs to help students rebuild skills and concepts. This year, the middle school teachers will continue to look at areas of need and share best practices at their grade level. They will also finish updating the pacing guides and explore Desmos. Desmos is a free interactive online platform that has pre-made lessons that allow middle school students to basically play with math. It's the middle schoolers equivalent of using manipulatives. So this play gives the students opportunities to manipulate data and see results of their changes in real time. This allows the students to make connections and solidify their understanding in a very engaging way. So we're looking forward to adding more of these types of lessons into the middle school math classes. And I'll now pass the presentation over to Ms. Roy, who will present on the science data. I can't tell you how happy I am that the curriculum and assessment team <clears throat> takes up the entire table. <laughs> That's wonderful. And thank you so much for your support of that. Um, so good evening, and tonight it's my pleasure to reflect on the district science and technology engineering performance data goals and action steps. I have big shoes to fill. Um, as you know, our curriculum teammate, Ed Smith, has moved on to Quincy High School, um, but I will do my very best to uh, present the district science team um, our performance in a clear and concise way. Uh, no, stay right here, Aaron. Thank you. Last year's district improvement goal was that students in grades five and eight will show evidence of achievement in science, technology, and engineering as measured by an increase of three scaled score points in the all students average scaled score from a baseline of 498 for grade five and 494.5 for grade eight. Our source of evidence is shown in the district achievement distribution by year report shared with us through the Department of Education's Edwin Analytics tool. Last year, we selected an average scale score to benchmark our progress. If you recall, um, with ELA and math being common core standards, they rolled out those MCAS assessments, the next generation, faster than they did the science. So science was going through uh, transitions just in the uh, last couple of years. So um, we, for a number of years, we presented slightly different data for science. This will be our last year of doing that. So um, for grade five, we hoped for an increase of three points in the all students average scaled score from a baseline of 498, hoping to bring us back above 500. But instead, we maintained our 2021 average scaled score. While I'm happy that we maintained and that we didn't dip, we did test 21 more students, so I was kind of hoping that maybe the needle would, would move just a little bit. But I remind myself that we're in recovery mode and to be patient with our students' progress. Looking at District 5, uh, District-wide Grade 5 results, we found strengths. Um, actually, Erin, we're still on that same slide. Uh, we found strengths in all four disciplines, Earth and Space Science, Life Science, Physical Science, and technology engineering, uh, particularly in core areas related to earth and human activity, molecules to organisms, hereditary engineering, um, energy and engineering design. That's just for grade five. With the elementary science team, there are some core ideas to look more closely at. Those would be motion and stability, forces and interactions, ecosystems, and earth systems. And that covers actually three of the four domains. We also want to look more closely at inquiry and investigation and how well students can engage in challenging tasks, uh, develop their thinking using models and diagrams, and maybe a little more practice at planning and carrying out investigations. From our high-level district analysis, it appears that some of our fifth graders are challenged by the constructed response questions. Those are the ones they have to really think about and compose a written response. Um, 
and uh, it asks them to analyze and interpret data, construct solutions, and present an argument using evidence from a model table or chart. They do this in class with their fifth grade curriculum, but it's a different environment when you're in a testing mode where your group or your teacher cannot support you. Please keep in mind that the Massachusetts curriculum um, learning standards offer some pretty rigorous science concepts at the elementary level. The good news is that most of our students are highly motivated by the content area and their hands-on experiences presented by their teachers. I have a lot of confidence that our fifth grade students will re-engage with their science this year and do their very best uh, on the spring 2023 MCAS test. Grade eight results are showing a nice steady increase from 2019. This year's grade eight students exceeded their goal and increased their average scaled score points uh, score by five points. Uh, these science MCAS charts show results by performance levels. Uh, we're pleased that uh, Quincy's fifth graders continue to outperform the state. However, we still had a slight 1% dip um, in students exceeding or meeting expectations, nothing that we can't turn around. Uh, we'd really like to bring that performance level up above the 50% mark, but I understand, again, that we are still coming out of this um, and regaining a sense of normalcy with our curriculum. So this may take some time, uh, but I'm confident we'll see these improvements. Looking at grade eight on the right, those results by performance level continue to show a great improvement from 2021. Last year's eighth graders show a 13.1 percentage point increase from 2021 to 2022 um, for scoring in the meeting and exceeding range. We'd like that trend to continue with our new cohort of eighth graders. From a district perspective, we'd like to look more closely at physical science, uh, specifically at how much time our pacing and alignment guide can give to the two major concepts within physical science before MCAS testing in April and May. Uh, this June 2022, the biology test, it was the first administration of the biology next generation computer-based uh, MCAS. Uh, we're happy to see that over 50% of our students performed in the meeting or exceeding category. We're 6.4% higher uh, when compared to the state. Um, no, you have to, uh, there's no 2021 data up there because first year of administration for this <clears throat> biology test. Um, so this will be our baseline. Um, the goal is to lower the number of students performing in the partially meeting expectations. Currently 36% of students um, and get them into the meeting expectations category. Some students who score in the high end of partially meeting um, will be able to meet their graduation requirement. They're working on those scores right now um, at the department. Okay, turning over to MAP. So last year's goal was that students will show evidence of growth in science as measured by the following increases in RIT points indicated in the spring 2022 MAP district summary report. Last year's goal was to obtain uh, seven RIT points above the fall average for grades four and five. The actual RIT growth from fall to spring for grade four was 4.8 points below our intended goal. And for grade five was 6.3 points just shy of our goal. Last year's middle school science goal was to increase by four RIT points above the fall average for grades six to eight. Our actual RIT growth for grades six from fall to spring increased 4.2 points, which means we met our goal. Our actual RIT growth for our grade seven grew 3.7 points, just shy of the goal. And our actual RIT growth for grade eight increased by 4.7 points, which means we met our goal for grade eight as well. Our students continue to demonstrate higher average RIT achievement than the national norm in all grade levels in the MAP Science Spring Benchmark. Our district MCAS goal for the 22-23 school year is going to focus on grade five, and our hope is that students will show evidence of achievement in science as measured by a total increase of three achievement percentage points in exceeding or meeting um, expectation levels, performance levels. Even two achievement points will bring us above the percentage for the last two years and push approximately another 13 to 15 students into our higher achievement performance level. For our district science map goal, we're going to monitor all grades that currently take the general science map benchmark, hoping to see 4.5 RIT points above the fall average for grades four and five, 
and four rip points above the fall average for grades six to eight. So in terms of reflecting, um, reflecting and generating some new action steps, Ed and the science team last year did such an incredible job. I really just made a few minor treat, uh, tweaks. So our curriculum team focus this year for the science team is to continue that strong emphasis on inquiry-based hands-on activities, not just doing them, but actually constructing arguments, um, making plans for analyzing the data, um, and presenting to their peers. We're gonna stay focused on uh, students demonstrating their understanding of natural phenomena and real world problems. Another team focus is going to assist in the coordination and the implementation of the Mass Life Science Equipment Grants at grades six to eight and for our high school's applied biotechnical lab enhancement. Both of those grants <clears throat> Ed Smith worked on with some community members and high school teachers. We're very proud of them for pulling that, um, making that funding available for um, our schools. At the elementary level, our targeted action steps will continue to explore the Museum of Science opportunities and implement engineering is elementary uh, curriculum units, and which include curric uh, equipment and uh, professional development for our teachers in grades three to five. We'll continue to offer extended day opportunities that target key science skills and knowledge for students in grades three to five. Um, actually, it says three to five, but really any opportunities for pre-K to five uh, that gives kids an experience in learning hands-on about um, uh, our science focus areas would be terrific. So Aaron and I will continue to work with the principals um, to make sure that those opportunities exist. Uh, for the middle school level, um, our goal is to increase student access to high-quality STEM and life sciences through the implementation of the PALS, or the Pathways for Aspiring Life Scientists, and that's part of the uh, Mass Life Science Equipment Grant. Uh, we're partnering with uh, the Science Department at Quincy College, who is providing training opportunities for our teachers so that they can appropriately and adequately and, and use the equipment with their students, uh, which is very exciting. It's more than we've, we've ever had uh, to put in kids' hands for those type of activities. Um, we'd like to fully, we'll continue to fully implement Project Lead the Way <clears throat> curriculum for all students in grades six through eight and include teacher training, professional development, supplies and equipment, and of course, um, a key emphasis on grade eight uh, to participate and design experiments for their STEM fair. If it includes additional grades, that's just a bonus, but grade eight is definitely our focus area. And at the high school level, our department chairs will facilitate data analysis of the 2022 grade 10 Next Generation Biology MCAS. They will align or adjust their instruction and assessments accordingly, and we'll continue our partnership with Quincy College to give students greater access to college completion and that career pipeline that involves everything from STEM innovation and um, medical and biotechnical uh, courses. So thank you very much, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bridget Vaughn. <coughs> Thank you, Maddie. <clears throat> so good evening. In the next set of slides, I'll be sharing with you a reflection on last year's English, English Language Arts District data and goals, and then we'll follow uh, with our new goals and action step for this current school year. So our achievement goal for last year was that during the 2021-22 school year, students in grades three through eight will show evidence of achievement in English Language Arts as measured by an increase of three achievement percentage points from spring 2021, as evidenced by the spring 22 PE303 MCAS results by achievement level school district and state comparison report. In grades three and four, we did not meet our goal of increasing by three points. Grade three students in the meeting or exceeding achievement levels decreased by 5.7 points from 55.7% to 50%. Grade four students decreased by 5.1 points from 47.9% to 42.8%. The good news is that both of these grade levels are well above the state. Grade three is six points above the state comparison and grade four is 4.4 points above the state. For grade five, while we didn't meet our goal, 
there was only a slight decrease from 43.6% in 2021 to 42.9% in 2022. Grade six is concerning, showing a drop from 45.5% to 40.6% of students meeting or exceeding expectations. The state comparison shows that grade five is above the states still by 2.3%, but in grade six, we're below the state average by 0.9%. So grade six will be a district focus for ELA and reading this year. We're very pleased with our increases in both grade seven and grade eight. For grade seven, we've increased our percentage of students in the blue bar graph there by 2.8% from 2021, and we're above the state by 7.3%. Grade eight shows even better results with an increase of students meeting or exceeding expectations by 3.4% and 7.5% above the state. There's also good news for our 10th grade students. In 2021, we had 69.1% of students either, either meeting or exceeding expectations on MCAS. In 2022, we increased this by 0.9% and had 62.8% of students at these achievement levels. Grade 10 students are also above the state uh, by 4.7%. Uh, the state's average of 58.1%. So moving on to our student growth goal from last year, we have during the 2021-22 school year, students in grades two through eight will show evidence of growth in reading as measured by the following increases in RIT points indicated in the spring 2021-22 MAP District Student Growth Summary Report. And we had that goal as 10 RIT point increases above the fall for grade two, five <clears throat> RIT points above the fall average for three and four, and three RIT points above the fall average for grades five through eight. So first we'll look at our growth from fall to spring, and then we'll take a look at where we fall in relation to the national norms. Each bar graph compar comparison represents grade level growth and map from fall to spring with the green bar showing fall and the purple bar showing spring. Um, grade three met the goal of increasing by five RIT points and increased by 11.2 RIT points. Grade four also met and exceeded the goal, growth goal, goal of five points with an increase of 6.6 .6 points. <coughs> grade five also met the goal, the three point goal increase with an increase of 5.1. Grades six and seven just missed the three-point goal with a two with 2.9 points increase in grade six and 2.7 points increase in grade seven. And grade eight did meet the goal with an increase of 3.2 points. So although <clears throat> excuse me, although we use MAP to measure percentages in individual student growth, it's helpful to look at how we measure up against the national achievement norms and Quincy students. As you know, are in the orange, the national grade level RIT achievement norms are in blue. And as you can see, Quincy is above the national achievement norms here in, in reading um, at all grade levels. <clears throat> so moving on to our goals for the 2022-23 school year. Um, our district ELA MCAS goal is uh, during the 2022-23 school year, students in grades three through eight will show evidence of achievement in English language arts as measured by a total increase of two achievement percentage points in exceeding or meeting achievement levels from the spring 2022, as evidenced by the spring 2023 PE 305 MCAS district achievement distribution by year report. Our student growth goal here for um, in map reading is that during the 2022-23 school year, students in grades two to eight will show evidence of growth in reading as measured by the following increases in RIT points, as indicated in the spring 22-23 MAP district growth, student growth summary report. Um, 10 RIT points above the fall for grade two, five above the fall for grades three and four, and three RIT points above the fall for grades five through eight. So um, 
Reflecting on our action steps from last year, um, as you may recall, last year we implemented a new um, early literacy screener. Um, so we trained our, our staff in that, and, and that is at full implementation right now. Um, and this new screening is done on the computer. Um, we get immediate results, and students are grouped um, into an instructional skill groups automatically. Um, we also um, added on the dyslexia screeners. So, um, and then I, I have some news about that as well. So um, then we also had some very specific action steps last year related to specific subtests in those M-Class results. And I'm going to be sharing a lot more about that with you um, during the Literacy Program Improvement Plan on October 26th. Uh, so for this year's action steps, in K-2 we'll continue to implement that M the new Early Literacy Universal and Dyslexia screener three times a year. Data from that screener will be analyzed and discussed during integrated learning team meetings and targeted supports and interventions will take place along with, with progress monitoring. Um, so I just wanted to also let you know about um, the amendment to the regulations on early literacy screening, which I'm really pleased that we've gotten a little bit ahead of that, as you'll see. So just recently on September 20th, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education amended special education regulations to add an early literacy screening requirement. And this regulation will go into effect on July 1st of 2023. Um, and that's for K-3. to So that and, and that regulation is for two times a year in K to three. Um, we all we already do three times a year. So we'll starting in next fall, we're going to be just adding grade three universally across the district to screen three times a year and use those um, other dyslexia screeners as well. Another action step for this year is as part of the growing literacy equity across Massachusetts GLEAM grant year two grant funding. Our K-5 teachers, literacy specialists, and our principals and assistant principals will participate in Amplify Core Knowledge Language Arts professional development, coaching, and training throughout this school year. And full implementation will begin um, in next fall. Uh, so as you know, um, we, last year, we had to, as part of the Glean Grant, we had to investigate and research all of um, these programs that are out there right now, and we had a 40 teacher pilot with two different programs, and um, Amplify Core Knowledge Language Arts is the new program for ELA for K-5. to um, So we've begun training on that this year. Another action step for K-5 to is that teachers will increase students' automaticity, fluency, and comprehension in reading by incorporating high quality supplemental programs based in the science of reading. So these include um, our increased licensing for programs like LexiaCore 5, the addition of the Hegarty Bridge the Gap intervention for grades 3, 4, and 5, and the addition of Hegarty Phonemic Awareness in pre-K as well as in K-2 this year. So in grades 6 to 8, um, our teachers will update and make revisions to the ELA reading pacing and alignment guides. We're going to keep some of those same action steps as we had last year due to you know, the MCAS results that I shared. Um, we need to strengthen students' ability to identify key ideas and details in both informational text and in literature, and continue to use close reading units to build um, and increase um, background knowledge, increase students' vocabulary and comprehension skills. We're going to have a particular emphasis on our common writing ass assessments, which mirror MCAS tasks. Um, so when I meet with our grade six to, to, to eight teachers um, for one of our system-wide professional development days coming up very soon, um, that is going to be the focus where we look at this data and we say, you know, how do we use this the ELA MCAS rubric for, for scoring and, you know, really use those common writing assessments as learning tools and not just as assessments. Um, and again, lastly, Grade six to eight teachers will increase students' automaticity, fluency, and comprehension by incorporating um, other high-quality programs based in the science of reading for um, supplemental work like Common Lit, um, Lexia Power Up, which, which is an intervention program that we've increased licensing for um, in grades six to eight, Newzella, ReadWorks, EdSight, 
These are things that mirror question types of MCAS as well. So um, we've, we've, that's our action step to really kind of beef up those supplemental programs in addition to our core program, um, Houghton Mifflin Collections. And now I will turn it over to Chris Tierney for our accountability data. Thank you, Mrs. Vaughn. Uh, good evening. I'll be taking you through this year's accountability data. Uh, there have been some changes in the accountability reporting for 2022. Uh, DZ has decided to produce some, but not all, of the information associated with the annual district and school accountability determinations. They have dubbed this the accountability light model, uh, in which they will report district, school, and student group level performance data for each of the approved accountability indicators as well as certain normative measures. DZ did not publish indicator targets, points for progress towards targets, progress ratings, or determinations of each <coughs> district's and school's need for assistance or intervention. These aspects of the traditional state accountability system may be reconsidered by DZ for future accountability reporting cycles. First up, we have the graduation and dropout rates for 2021. For accountability determinations in any given year, high school graduation and annual dropout data is lagged, which is why you are seeing the 2021 percentage as opposed to the 2022 data. For graduation rates, we see a slight decrease in the percentage of students graduating from a few of the subgroups, which we attribute uh, to the learning loss caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the annual dropout rate, the dropout rate decreased significantly for African-American and multiracial students, but increased for our Hispanic and EL student population. It should be noted, however, that Maura Papil and her team works to recover these students and bring them back to the schools to earn a diploma. For 2022 chronic absenteeism, we're seeing a high percentage of African-American, Hispanic, Latino, and students with disabilities missing 20% or more days. It is important to note that the state did change this indicator from 10% of days to 20% of days uh, due to the impact the pandemic has caused. We expect the absenteeism uh, percentage to decrease over the coming years as students continue to experience a more, to ex continue to experience more normalized school years. For high school advanced coursework completion, we're pleased to see that the majority of student subgroup, subgroups increase significantly. We attribute this success to the work our teachers are doing by encouraging our students to take advanced coursework. Thank you, Chris. So just uh, to wrap up this section before we turn it over to the superintendent, uh, we are you know, following our, our typical model of how we do handle our MCAS data. So we begin, we have disaggregated the data. Christopher has provided tons and tons of data to the principals regarding their um, MCAS scores, their MAP scores. They have all of that data in their hands. If they want to look at it different ways, they just reach out to him and he helps um, work them through that. And so today they had the elementary and middle schools had their assessment day. Um, so that was a long day today and they all uh, worked on their assessment day where they review the data, they meet as grade level teams, vertical teams, and they start to create their school improvement plan goals and action steps. Um, so we'll continue throughout the year to have department meetings, uh, vertical team meetings, and grade level team meetings. You know, these did kind of take a back seat in the last two years because of things like substitute coverage, absenteeism. These things were really difficult uh, for us to maintain during the past two years. So we're really hopeful that we'll be able to reinstitute things like vertical team and grade level team meetings because those are opportunities for teachers to work together, to share ideas. The, the best activity that you can do that we get the best feedback on is when teachers are able to share best practices with each other. Um, and so, you know, we, we really want to be able to provide some of those opportunities, uh, you know, at different points throughout the year. Our integrated learning team meetings have, those have not taken a back seat. Those definitely did happen even during COVID and we will continue to um, have those happen and work, as Bridget said, with our, our students in terms of looking and our staff in terms of the dyslexia screener um, and all of the other data that the schools collect on our individual students. 
student support team meetings um, have continued and will continue. And then you do all know that um, the program improvement plans have already started. So we had two of them presented last week. More will be coming um, within the month and um, November. And then um, we have also the school improvement plans that are upcoming, I think, um, in November, early November and uh, after Thanksgiving. So, um, you know, we're, we'll be moving into the process of implementing our goals and action steps after the, the teams and the teachers have created them. And then as we do every year and as we just did now, we'll reflect on the progress that we've made uh, and the areas that we need to continue to work on. And I'll turn it over to Superintendent. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mrs. Perkins, and thank you, team, for going through that um, analysis. I do want to just touch on the balance of the uh, superintendent's goals. Um, the uh, first is the superintendent's professional practice goal. And as you may recall, uh, that goal was administer administrative mentoring and evaluation. So during the 2021-2022 school year, the superintendent will evaluate all principals, directors, and coordinators. In addition, the superintendent will mentor and support new school and district administrators to ensure retention. Um, this slide is um, certainly not new. It's very familiar, certainly in, in this district. It is the five-step cycle for educator evaluation. It also applies to principals and SLT. Obviously, the self-assessment, analysis, goal setting, and plan development, the implementation of the plan, the form of assessment, assessment and evaluation, and the summative evaluation. Uh, as you see, we've completed most of all of those steps. We're in the process now of completing the summative evaluation and hopefully that will be done by the end of uh, October. And again, the MCAS data coming in at this time, it's really critical that we have that data to help us um, <clears throat> complete the summative evaluations for our principals in SLT. Uh, some of the sources of evidence that we use and have used in the past and continue to use um, are uh, on this slide. Um, it's both qualitative and quantitative uh, data that we use. Um, so we have obviously the program and, and school improvement plan review, professional development plan, the principal weeklies that are published weekly by our principals, assessment day agendas and notes, staff evaluations that would be our, um, professional and non-professional staff evaluations, building visits that are conducted by myself and Mrs. Perkins and other members of the SLT, obviously student achievement and growth data which you just reviewed, uh, school safety plans as well as culture and climate. Uh, the next goal um, that we um, have to review tonight and reflect upon is Superintendent's District Improvement Goal number two, and that is the home school connections. So during the 2021-2022 school year, the superintendent's leadership and principal teams in collaboration with the Quincy Parent Advisory Council for Special Education the English Learner Advisory Council and the Citywide Parent Council will plan and execute at least 10 home school connection events. And the sources of evidence, this is just a sampling of some of the events that we had uh, throughout the year. I just wanted to highlight some of them. Again, we have so many um, of these home school connections. This is just a sampling. Obviously, we had the <coughs> Quincy Multicultural Festival, which was a great success this year. We have our LPAC quarterly meetings, our High school course selection night with family liaisons and thank you to the school committee for helping us support our family liaisons which help us to better communicate with and reach out to our families. Obviously a QPAC subcommittee reports and presentations, uh, QPS and QPAC sponsored events such as the trunk or treat, drums alive and gingerbread night. The citywide parent organizational meetings and as you know particularly during COVID uh, we had countless meetings with regard to COVID updates uh, and uh, other uh, updates for our citywide parent uh, teacher organizations and community meetings. Um, our EDI subcommittee forum with principals, uh, welcome to kindergarten event, uh, early college high school pathway parent night, and of course uh, a night of uh, anti-vaping or vaping prevention and intervention. Again, those are just a sampling of some of the highlights of our homeschool connections and sources of evidence in that area. And then the superintendent's district improvement goal number three, which is the system initiative management. And the goal here is that the superintendent will work with principals, the superintendent's leadership team, the school community and stakeholders to renew, establish, and manage a minimum of 15 system initiatives during the 2021-2022 school year. 
uh, initiative effectiveness will be measured through school committee and subcommittee presentations, ben benchmarks, action steps, and sources of evidence. Here is just a slide indicating um, those initiatives that we established for 2021. 2022 it covers everything from leadership and governance and communication, curriculum and instruction, um, obviously program evaluation and assessment, HR and management, as well as budget development. Of course, that's a very large part of um, our connection with the school committee as well. Um, obviously, our um, student support um, categories, which you see is numerous, as well as our financial asset management. Uh, and effectiveness and efficiency throughout the district. Again, this is just uh, some of the initiatives that we're working on. And uh, here are some of the sources of evidence just for you to review. Obviously, our management response to COVID-19, which was, has been a major focus for the last two years, budget development and monitoring, particularly with regard to, obviously, our um, QPS budget, uh, which covers all aspects of uh, QPS operations. Our partnership events, I can't speak highly enough of our partnerships. As I said before, we're the envy of many, many districts with regard to our partnership um, uh, contributions and, um, and affiliations. And Quincy has an extremely strong partnership that we are extremely proud of. Obviously, the REACH program, new curriculum pilots, Project Lead the Way, the mentoring program. Uh, new teach point implementation to assist with the educator evaluation process, obviously restorative practices, a multi-tiered system of support for our students. Uh, Post-secondary initiatives, obviously our early college high school, which has been a, a big undertaking over the last year or so. Our dual enrollment programs and CVTE pathways, technology planning and training. Our MSBA projects, obviously we have uh, all of the um, roof projects and boiler projects, but also the new Squanum Elementary School, which we're very proud of. And of course, our own uh, project with regard to the DeCristofaro Learning Center, which will be coming online within two years or so. Uh, parent liaisons, again, thank you for that support. And of course, our Dove partnership, which we're very grateful for. Next is just a slide. I won't go through all of this, but it's just, and, and you're very familiar with this, it's just uh, school committee connections which cover everything from budget and finance, facilities and transportation, athletics and wellness policy, special education, teaching and learning, as well as equity, diversity and inclusion. And of course, we're very proud of and um, very happy to have Kim Conley on board as our new EDI director to help us facilitate all of our EDI initiatives within the Quincy Public Schools. The last slide is just kind of at a glance how all of our um, plans come together. Obviously, the district improvement plan and system connections and all the interrelated planning, the common goals and shared responsibility and thoughtful planned and sustainable planning so that what we put in place not only benefits our students today, but in years to come. Uh, and again, this is just at a glance at the, all of the planning that it takes to put, um, to put these programs together. Obviously, it takes a team. I'm very proud of my team. We have an excellent team up here at Coddington. Of course, we have to thank the school committee for all of your support in supporting our team, as well as all of our uh, systems throughout the Quincy Public Schools, our educator staff, our guidance staff, every, our custodial staff, our bus driver staff, our bus monitor staff, our security staff, our secretaries, our paraprofessionals, mm -hmm. and all the other staff who make this a reality uh, for us, for our students and our families. Again, our goal is to do our very best educationally for our students and families. That's why we're here every day. And I'm very proud of all the efforts my team has made. And of course, with the support of the school committee in making this a reality for our students and families. So with that, thank you all. And we'll open uh, for questions. Okay, Mrs. Hubley. Thank you, I'll be really fast. I just actually have a, um, the accountability data. Um, could we get these in, um, not in percentage, could we have like actual number of students? I, I'm very concerned about the graduation dropout rate and the absenteeism specifically, and it would be easier to look at this in actual students than looking at it like percentages. Absolutely. Thank you. Certainly look into that, I'll get that to you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm good, yeah. Mrs. Good. Lebo. I have a couple. Um, I, I, I noticed that the enrollment at Southwest was 433. What was that school built for, do we know? 
Um, I'm not. It was built for three ninety. <clears throat> three ninety. Three ninety, and now we're at four thirty three. Yes, we got additional lockers and furniture last year, I believe, yeah, yeah. through the uh, public buildings department. Kind of a numbers crunch at that end of the city, the ongoing numbers crunch. Yes. Um, so I think I got this answer as I listened to the rest of the presentation, but if a student had to be out because of COVID, they were still held responsible for those absences, absences? Yeah, we still had to report those absences. But they did yeah. give us 20% as opposed mm -hmm. to... Right, and they're not, I, you know, we should clarify that they provided us with this data, but they're not, it's not like we're being penalized for it no, like before. We don't have targets yet. This is just a baseline. And um, so even though, I mean, obviously the numbers are significant, as we all know, uh, you know, this and this, I do want to say that this only mentions students. You know, we also know that there were staff you know, that were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic as well and the things that went along with that over the past two years. So you can understand why this then equated to pretty significant learning loss because kids were out, staff was out, you know, it was kind of a perfect storm um, for what ended up happening. But um, but they, they are not, these account, these are just like baselines right now. So they haven't given us any new targets. Um, you know, we're not, we're not, like I said, there's no, like, you know, before it would, you'd say like, oh, you didn't meet your points or you only got this many points. Um, and it could impact your, you know, your overall accountability data for your individual school or for the district. That's not the case this year. And I don't know if it'll be the case next year because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. Right. They have not said. So as Chris said, they're saying like it's basically under consideration right now. They, they haven't made any decisions. So whether or not they'll give us targets in the future, uh, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, I think what if it was my recommendation, not that they will listen to me, but I think that they should collect a couple of years of data because it's going to take us a while to get, I mean, we, you know, when we look back and we thought we were looking at these scores, it was, it, you know, especially, you know, Bridget and her team, you know, to see ELA. When you think about when we would talk to you before and we'd be like, oh, you know, we really need to increase the proficiency here. And then to see it drop like that was really heartbreaking um, for us and for, I'm sure, you know, for the district as a whole. So in the state as a whole, really, because it's what we're seeing is the same as what the state is seeing. Um, and so I do think and I, I think that if you asked Rob Curtin at the Department of Education, he would absolutely agree this is going to take years. Yeah. I'm, I'm really not that concerned about the scores that much, really. I think that, I think they're pretty good. I really do. Um, are we, do we have any plans to replace Mr. Smith? Yes, we do. Yes, we're in the process of uh, doing that now. Right. Yes. Right. Because I do, uh, to Madeline's point, Ms. Roy's point, I do think he was very valuable yes. in that role. And I'm also concerned because no science goal was listed for grade 10, uh, and, but 10% of the 10th grade has failed the test. Um, and so that means I, I'd like to know, it doesn't have to be tonight, but I would like to know how many 10th graders are at risk or have to take one or more tests, repeat tests. Sure. So yeah. th th this year's 11th graders, I'm sorry. Yes, right. yep, we can absolutely get that for you. I, I don't need it tonight, but yeah. I would just like to know, because that's really what I'm, I'm not so concerned about a dip in the scores a little bit, but kids not graduating is heartbreaking. And we can definitely add that as a goal if we need to as well. Thank you. And also, um, on slide 34, the ELA targeted action steps, I think you said that they were, the state's now requiring literacy assessments K through five? K through three. Um, so as of July 2023, they're requiring it for K through three. We already, this year, currently do it okay. for K to two. So we're going to be okay, adding. So you just have to add that one. Grade three, okay. yes. And also, is the vocal data coming soon? Because that will help us with the cultural piece yes. of this. So we do have the vocal data. We are currently working. It's massive. There is so much information. And we debated on whether or not to include it tonight, but this presentation was, was already like pretty long. And so what we decided was it really, because there is so much information, and it's actually really good information, um, but it, it definitely warrants its own meeting where that is the focus. So either at an upcoming school committee meeting or at a teaching and learning meeting, um, we are going to present it. We, Chris has already started working on it. It will be in the school improvement plans. You will see it in their presentations as well. OK, thank you. Um, yes, and so I, I think we'll be moving to our summative evaluation at this point then. Mr. Santoro, mm -hmm. correct? Right, I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Cattrall? 
A uh, couple of questions. Thanks again for the comprehensive uh, presentation, <clears throat> as you do every year. I mean, it, it, it's pretty impressive. Um, so I, I had a couple of questions. Uh, the, uh, the goals say 21, 22, or 22, 23. But then, uh, for example, on the uh, other data, it says chronic absenteeism 2022. Do I assume that that's all 2021, 2022? Or it, none of it's this this year, 22, 23. Correct. None of it is this year. So when year, it says no. 22, it means last year. It's last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, Mrs. Lebo mentioned this. So, you know, my, my concern is around graduation rates, dropout rates, chronic absenteeism, uh, and advanced courses. And and it, it all seems to, to be disproportionately impacting Students with disabilities, African Americans, Hispano, Hispanic Latino, um, low income, and e EL students. Um, it, it seems disproportionate on all of those fronts. So, uh, at least for the chronic absenteeism, are we seeing any changes in the first two months of this school year? Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I definitely think we are. Mm -hmm. it, it, we are. And and are we doing kind of uh, analytics on on those populations, because that's what concerns me. And, and then it, I, I also wondered if uh, the lower MCAS scores correlate to similar demographics, if we've done that breakdown as well. Um, we haven't looked at that, or at least I don't have that with me right now. Uh, Chris may have, have pulled that, but we haven't talked about that as a group. Um, but you know, I will say I do think that I think that when you think about chronic absenteeism, we our hands were tied. Last you know, they, year, last, no, last year and the year before. Yep. I mean, there were there were regulations that said that if you had a if you were a, a close contact of a person in your house, you're automatically out for 20 days. Right. You know, and so no, um, I understand. Yeah, it, it's and baseline so, data. so you expect all of those numbers to increase across demographics this year. I do. I, I definitely think that the chronic absenteeism we're going to see go down because the regulations around COVID and absences, although it's still, um, you know, a five day um, absence requirement if you test positive, it, I do think, you know, that it's going to, we're going to see it get less and less. Um, it, but, and I also think that what, you know, you'll see throughout the year, which is what we do, is that this, in terms of the dropout rate, um, Maura Papil has a dropout intervention team. We meet we have all the names of the kids. We know what's going on with each of those kids. And we constantly try to reach out to those families, which is where we've been so successful. So even though we've seen an increase, our numbers are significantly below the state. And so, you know, I think that that's why we've been so successful is because we do not give up. We keep reaching out. We have Quincy Evening High School. We have goals. We do all kinds of, we modify days if we need to. I mean, we do all kinds of creative things for our kids because we want them to get Get a diploma. I mean, that's ultimately, you know, you cannot really do anything in this world if you don't have a diploma. And so I do think um, that we will definitely see those numbers as we get back. I mean, there were some kids, you know, that had to work. We know that. Mara and I know that because we would talk to the mm -hmm. high school guidance counselors about these individual students because we knew we were losing them. And um, they had to work to support their families, you know. So there were so many unique situations and circumstances, but we will absolutely try to recover as, and get those kids diplomas for as many of those kids as we <clears throat> possibly can. I would like to, you know, keep in EDI subcommittee the graduation, the dropout, the chronic ab absenteeism, and the advanced coursework and just do a deeper dive on that sure. and look at it throughout the year and, and see if we can get yeah, some, no some numbers that show changes or, or know, targeted interventions. Absolutely. Thank you very much. This is Cahill. So I, I guess my, my comment would be we can't be surprised by some of the data, right, mm -hmm. for the past um, couple of years. Um, when do we do our first MAP assessments? It already happened. It so, has happened. Yep, it happens in September. So mm -hmm. has that given us a good indication of, you know, how the students are doing this year? It does. Uh, well, it does. it's the very beginning, it's right? A, yeah, and so. you do see a drop. You know, yeah. historically, you see a drop. Like the, it's like the summer slide a little bit. You right. know, when you start school, yeah. but um, it does. You know, I, I mean, I think that the one 
you know, kind of saving grace in all of our scores is that we had the map. So we do need to thank you for that support because we have data that allows us to see, even though some of our scores have decreased, it allows us to actually see individual student progress, progress by class, progress by grade. And so that even though MCAS might have not been perfect over the past couple of years, some, they didn't take it one year, they took it partially. We had the map to help us kind of keep track of our kids. Um, and it also still shows, you know, some of the positive things because there are positive things, you know, in the data. And, and I think that the map does a nice job of showing that. And I like it too, because it's, it's real time assessment, right? Yeah, so we're it is, seeing yep. what they're mm -hmm. doing um, in real time. And then, so when's the next one? It's it um, in January. In January. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I guess that's my, that's my, that was my question, just to see, you know, kind of get a sense of where they are this year. Um, and do you feel like the past couple of months that the students are more engaged and more, you know, involved in school than the, obviously the past two years? But are they starting to get, you know, back comfortable to the, the system and the process mm -hmm. and the, you know, being in school? I think we've definitely had a more normal start to the school year than we have in years past. I mean, we still have our, our ups and downs and uh, things that, you know, we need to uh, work on with our students. And it is the beginning of the year. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, the honeymoon period is over in some respects. But, um, but I do think it's been a more normal start to the school year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Mr. Bergoli. Just a couple of points. Um, with the retest in November for MCAS, is the Department of Education going to hold fast uh, passing those, you know, for a graduation requirement? Or are they going to uh, cut a little slack, given? Yeah, they, What's they, they did set, Maddie has the new um, target, so they don't, you can score in partially meeting and still meet your graduation requirement. They have changed those, and Maddie has them, but, um, and then you can also do what's called an EPP, and so if you take um, courses, so if you reach a certain score, you don't necessarily meet the graduation requirement, but you can take, like, say, math courses, and you still earn your diploma, but Maddie can give you the, the data on that. <laughs> no, Maddie can't quite, but um, Aaron just did a great job. The only thing I was going to mention is the competency determination. So we're on the very last, we're almost on the very last year of that. Um, they didn't use the word waiver, Mr. Bergoli, but that's basically was what it was. And um, if they didn't get a certain score for their graduation requirement, they could pass our, our course mm -hmm as well as maybe be on the EPP that Aaron mentioned. So uh, we were looking at that. We're sort of on the last legs of that. Um, this year's um, seniors, uh, Mrs. Lebo, will benefit from that in terms of uh, the science requirement. Um, and then it will, now that they have the new uh, next generation biology test, we will go back to fulfilling, they have to meet the cut score. So we're, we're staying on top of that and um, Mars team of student support is, as Erin said, offering them anything after school or the evening school to make sure that they can pass their courses. Thank you. Um, and one other question. Um, the, the data that you cited for MCAS comparisons between grade levels uh, between 21 and 22, um, I brought this up a couple of years ago, and I, it seems as if you've gone back to, to the other way. Um, when you're comparing grade six in 21, you shouldn't be comparing it to grade six in 22 because they're not the same class. Mm -hmm. You should be comparing it to grade se uh, seven in 22. Uh, and I, I just noticed that we've gone back to that. And I don't think that's an accurate uh, reflection of how we do, how we did. So. I don't know if that can be corrected uh, going forward, but. It, it can, and I will tell you that the reason that we did that is because if you were a student in say grade six, the last time you took the MCAS was in grade three. So there was like significant. It's a good thing. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's why, so we needed some like measure for ourselves this year, but yes, we, I totally agree with you. We absolutely will go back to that, but you know, students in grade 10, the last time they took the MCAS was grade seven. So, you know, so th that, those were the reasons that we did that. But I absolutely agree with you, yes. Okay. And just one last thing is um, with the absenteeism, I mean, <coughs> where they, some of them weren't required to go to school. They, they you know, they, they could stay home and, 
you know, getting back to the swing of things is very difficult uh, in terms of uh, getting up, you know, getting a routine, uh, getting back to school, getting... Um, so I, I can see where that is problematic uh, and will continue to be mm -hmm. for a while because of the fact that they just haven't been required to uh, be there on a consistent basis or um, um, just do what they did before. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm concerned about it, but uh, I think it's something that uh, will turn around with, uh, with time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Mayor Cook. Yeah, thank you, team, superintendent, everybody. Appreciate the information. It is helpful. Um, I often say, you know, every, every human being is equal in dignity and worth, but we're not all equal in talent. And that's what gets frustrating with the MCAS. Uh, I think we all agree. We need a measurement tool. It is the tool the state provides, but it doesn't really tell the whole story of our kids. Uh, and I, I know a number of people who struggle through school and now are successfully running businesses and doing very well in life. Um, and the other thing, you know, the word equity, you know, it, it's not always an equity of effort either, right? So there's some of these challenges you describe with some of these kids that aren't getting to school or are tidy in school. Maybe it's not support at home. They don't want to be in school. Uh, and and that's, that becomes a mark on the district. So that there's not always an equity of effort on the kids and the family side as well. And I think that people got to keep that in mind when we, when we look at things that balance. But uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all the information. Thank you. Did you want to say? Yeah, just one quick thing. Just um, to reiterate that you support what uh, Ms. Perkins said. I've heard from several middle school, high school students, families, and teachers that things are getting back to normal. Mm -hmm. They're feeling yeah. much, much better about school this year. Mm -hmm. Kids, parents, and teachers. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged. So I think it's going to be. I think yeah, too. Mm -hmm. just, just one question. Given the different types of questions that are asked in the different subject areas, what would you say that open response in SA seems to be the most difficult in the success of our kids? I, I think, I mean, Maddie can add to this, but I definitely think the open response, anything co constructed response, but key ideas and details continues to be an area of concern too. Um, but I do, I do think that this year in particular, I think we, we, we had a few years ago, we actually saw a, like a strength in writing with our work in writing, and we have lost that. Um, but I do think that the constructive response, the open response is always a challenge, but I don't know if you want to add to that. You know, it's funny that you bring that up because um, we were talking about key ideas and details. So, Mr. Santoro, we've been around MCAS since 1999, right? Correct. And that has, that has stayed a major focal point. So obviously it's a major focal point for English language arts and reading, but it's just interesting that that always comes up historically, never seems to change. Well, I only bring it up for a reason, because back when I was at Central, that seemed to be the same issue. Yeah. yeah. And every teacher chipped in. It wasn't just an issue for math teachers and English teachers. The whole school became involved in open response. So that if every teacher gave at least one open response question on a test, whether it be the art teacher, the music teacher, didn't matter. And there was a way to explain to everybody that this is the format that we're all going to use in open response. Our scores improved drastically. So just throw that out there. Thank you. Anybody else? I like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have time for lunch during the day? Or... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're on item B, school nurse appointment. Uh, Maureen Dirge, uh, Superintendent uh, Mulvey. Thank you. Before you is the resume of Maureen Durgan. She will be hired as our school resource nurse, which means she would be covering absences um, throughout the district, depending on wherever the absence occurs within the district. So our school resource nurse currently is being moved to cover an absence due to a resignation at one of our elementary schools. And so this uh, particular nurse would be hired, would be hired to cover the school resource nurse that we have within the district. Motion to approve. A motion of the Mayor Koch, seconded by Mrs. Hubley. Superintendent, call the roll. 
Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gatro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayaco? Yes. Thank you. Item C, MASC General Session Resolutions Introduction. Uh, these resolutions will be voted on at the October 26th meeting. Mrs. Hubley for comment? Yeah, so um, on November 2nd through November 5th, I will be attending the Massachusetts Association of School Committees um, um, conference as a delegate. And before you, you have six resolutions that will be voted on. Um, I will be voting on behalf of this committee at that time. Um, today, I'm just presenting to you that you have the resolutions in front of you. We will be meeting on October 26th for discussion and vote on these resolutions. So you have some time to review them and bring your comments and questions at that time. And I should have more information at that time on them. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Jubilee. Item D, creating a QPS employee lead bank. This is a referral to the Budget and Finance Subcommittee by Mr. Gatro. Any comment, Mr. Gatro? Or? Yeah. Um you know, I'm under the impression that I learned that there isn't a leave bank within QPS. And in uh, in my workplace setting, which uh, I'm in the federal government, we have a leave bank where employees are allowed to donate into a leave bank every year. And it's basically employees helping employees. It's, it's really an opportunity to do that. I don't know what the legal restrictions may be or parameters are, but it's something that I thought this committee should explore because I know that it has been absolutely invaluable for some of my colleagues uh, in the workplace that might exhaust um, vacation time, might exhaust sick time, uh, don't have access to any of that. You know, there are unpaid FMLA provisions, but this is an opportunity to actually have colleagues that you work with donate their sick time to you so that you have the opportunity if you have a chronic condition or some problem to donate. So I thought it was worthwhile for us to explore that. Thank you. Mayor Koch. Uh, just going further, when you get into the committee meeting, we can probably provide some information from the city side because it's it's really broken out into uh, different contracts and different unions, and some of the peers actually vote on granting uh, people to leave as, as they donate. So it's it's uh, it gets a little complicated because it becomes contractual in many cases, but we can provide some information to help the committee. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Lebo. Can we also get some information? I believe this did exist once. I'm sorry? In Quincy Public Schools, I believe we did have a bank once, a sick leave bank. I know the city of Boston did, but I don't, I can't recall. Okay. <laughs> we'll try and do some history on okay, that. Thank you. Maybe it was Boston. <laughs> okay. Um, QP, item E, QPS security in, at school events for referral to the facilities and security and transportation subcommittee, Mrs. Cahill. Any comment? Yes, um, I'd just like to um, refer to the committee that we can um, maybe do a review of what we do at um, school-sponsored events, what our security is, what we do now, what we do well, and maybe if there are some areas that we can um, beef up and improve what we're doing. You know, some members in the community reached out and they have some concerns, so just want to make sure we're doing the best that we can to keep the kids safe and the community safe at school events. Okay. Item six, additional business. Any additional business before the committee? Seeing none, we move on to um, communications. Uh, just for information, upcoming school committee meetings, Wednesday, October 26th, November 16, December 7, right here at Coddington. Upcoming subcommittee meetings at Coddington. Athletics and Wellness, December 5th. Budget and Finance, October 19. Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, November 30. Policy, October 19, November 9, Special Ed, December 5th, Teaching and Learning, November 9, November 14, November 28, November 29, November 30. I assume those are all for our school improvement <laughs> plans. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Will we have time for lunch? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Reports of subcommittees, there are none. Executive session on a motion of Mrs. Lebo, seconded by Mr. Brigoli. We go into executive session for contract negotiations. Are we returning, Superintendent? Uh, no. We will not be returning. Thank you. I think I have to do a roll call. We have a roll call. Now. Roll call vote, roll call. please. Mr. Brigoli. Yes. Mrs. Cahill. Yes. Mr. Gatro. Yes. Mrs. Hubley. Yes. Mrs. Lebo. Yes. Mrs. Santoro. Yes. Mayaco. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.